Oh boys. Actually didn't, that's interesting. Um, anyways, thank you, uh, Cecilio, uh, for the gracious introduction and, and also for the, uh, I think, wise words of wisdom. Um, uh, just because you opened the, the conversation about, you know, why are we talking about energy at this moment in time? Let me, you know, let me, let me give the, the three sentence answer uh, to why we're talking about energy. And then I'm going to ask you also to let me share my screen if I don't already have that capability so I can share some slides. Um, the three sentence answer is sentence number one, um, the energy system is driving us off the, driving the planet out of the realm of human habitability. Um, full stop. Uh, I know people like to blame capitalism. I know people like to blame values. I know people like to blame all sorts of things for our current planetary crisis. Um, but bottom line, it is the design of our energy system that is the proximate cause uh, for our planetary unsustainability problems uh, at the present. And if we don't fix the energy system, we're not going to fix the sustainability challenge, period. It is the single uh, biggest piece of the puzzle. Uh, it is in some ways the hardest piece of the puzzle, and we have to figure out how to do it. The second reason, the second sort of sentence is that um, we actually don't think about it this way, but the energy system is also one of the most unjust human systems that we have. It contributes to all kinds of nastiness in the world, um, in all kinds of different places, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and that leads to the, the third sentence, which is we have this opportunity in front of us. We are going to change the energy system over the next three decades. I know many of you may not believe that, um, but as I talk to folks at the inside the energy industry these days, every day, um, in fact, one this morning at 8 a.m. Uh, said to me, uh, carbon neutrality is table stakes, meaning that is now the default assumption of the energy industry. We must get to carbon neutrality. There are lots of ways to get there. They're not fully convinced that we know how to do it. Um, they are still wrapping their heads around what it means for their operations um, and all kinds of things. Um, but within the energy industry, uh, it is now taken for granted uh, that we have to get to carbon neutrality. Now that doesn't mean the end of fossil fuels necessarily for them but it means we have to figure out how to get to a point where we're no longer uh, dumping net, carb net positive carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And in fact, many of them believe that carbon negative is now the default place that we have to get. We have to get to a place where human society is actually contributing to removing carbon from the atmosphere as a net sum, right? So that's, we're, we're gonna do that. But the question is, what, are, what else are we gonna do as we do it? And that is this huge opportunity to build much better futures for humanity. The International Energy Agency says we're gonna spend $100 trillion over the next 30 years to get to carbon neutrality. So if we invest $100 trillion of all of our hard earned money, to get to carbon neutrality, if all we get for that is a carbon neutral energy system, I will be deeply, deeply dismayed. That investment should be made in the human future, right? In building a just, bright, thriving, prosperous, awesome future for humanity. That's enough money to do it. So that's what I wanna kind of focus on today. And, and when I say innovation, so Cecilio, you know, I always right up front uh, with uh, critical perspectives, right? Uh, and of course, innovation is in some sense this bad word. It's this word that uh, the biggest corporations in the world use to talk about 
incremental changes that don't fundamentally uh, change very much, but make them more profitable. Uh, and, and so I just want to, you know, from the get go say, look, when I use the word energy innovation, as I've done in my title, um, what I mean by that is change for the better, right? That's all I mean by using the word innovation. In fact, I'm trying to steal their word, right? I'm trying to co-op them into the project of making all of us better off. Uh, by talking about it in terms of uh, energy innovation. So let me see if I can share my screen here. I think I should be able to. Nope, it's still disabled. Okay. Um, so if you go under the participant list, you'll find my name. And to the right of that, there's a, a dot, 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 or a more. And under there, it sh there should be a way to make me a co-host. You got it, my friend. There we go. Thank you. All right. I've been using Zoom way too much. <laughs> way, way too much. <laughs> so you're going to see my evolution here in this, these slides. You're going to see why I, although I'm trained as an engineer, Celia's absolutely right about that, uh, why I haven't done engineering in 30 years. Um, and you, you'll see that uh, evolution as, as we go through. Um, so, you know, there's this word in the title, busy town. I, I don't know how many of you know what busy town is. Um, I know that when I was growing up in the 1970s, um, my parents read to me about busy town every day. And I know that I read Busy, about busy town to my son, who's now 12, every day when he was five years old. Uh, and it is the setting of these amazing children's books uh, by an author, Richard Scarry, uh, two of which are the, some of the most prominent are um, What Do People Do All Day? Uh, which is a, a book about exactly what you might imagine it's about, right? You know, it's about, you know, when your parents go out into the world, when they leave home and go do stuff, what are they doing, right? So it's about all the jobs uh, that are out there in, in the world, at least one vision of it, right? And then there's a book called Cars and Trucks and Things That Go. And as you can imagine, little boys love this book. Uh, it's, it, it's functionally about what is an automobile society, right? How have we organized our world around cars and trucks? and gas pumps and gas stations and, and gasoline trucks and, and all of those things, all of the paraphernalia that go with it, roads, uh, camping trips, um, uh, you know, armies that run on diesel, right? Cars and trucks and things that go is all about all the vehicles in our lives. Uh, and what people are doing with all of those vehicles in their lives. So the question is, why am I focusing on busy town? Uh, and you guys had a chance to read, some of you at least, the class students in the class had a chance to read a number of different essays that I've been re writing recently, where I've been using busy town as kind of the, the uh, foil uh, for my writing. Uh, so wh why? why, why busy town? So, Here's, here's my short answer to why busy town. Um, busy town is where we all live. Uh, and um, I've conveniently um, uh, covered up the text on this with all of your pictures. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> having to remind myself exactly what I wrote over in that right-hand column on this slide. Um, uh, but the, the point is that where we live, where we work, where we play, is all these days in environments that we have constructed for ourselves through the fashioning of large technological systems. Right, so you see here one page from this book, What Do People Do All Day? And it's the page that is the electricity system. 
and you have a coal-fired power plant and you have the coal train that's bringing coal on the left-hand side to the coal-fired power plant. Uh, and of course, on the previous page, you have the coal mine, right? So where, where all the coal is getting from. And so you have, you know, the coal miners. Uh, and you have here the guy who is shoveling the coal into the elevator uh, that's taking it up into the power plant. Uh, and you have the person who's running the elevator. And you have the person who's driving the train. And you have the person who is running the boiler room. And uh, you have the, pers the, the small mouse way over on the right-hand side in the substation, right, who's managing the substation right, and standing in for the entire electric utility industry <laughs> over there, right? Um, and of course, these electricity lines are then running into our houses out in the suburbs somewhere. Uh, and of course, in the 50s, when Richard Scarry was writing these, there were still houses where the electricity infrastructure was bolted onto the outsides of the walls. We've now, for the most part, put that infrastructure inside the walls right, so that it's hidden. And the only thing that we can see are the electrical plugs. And those are down low now uh, at the bottom so that we're often hiding them behind things. So that we don't even see when we look around the room of our house that we have an electricity infrastructure, but of course it's all still there, right? And, and the house is full of gadgets that we plug into that electricity system that make our lives today uh, what they are. There's a, a mixer and an electric kettle and an electric stove and an electric toaster and an electric refrigerator and a television and a, and a vacuum cleaner, right? So that when we think about the lives that we live today, uh, particularly here in the United States and the houses that we live in, we are living in environments that have been created at least in part through the electricity industry. And my favorite, of course, is a little pig who sits up on top of the power plant reading a book about Ohm's law. And, and it's my favorite because he's the electrical engineering student. Ohm's law is what they teach you on the first day of circuits in an electrical engineering major. Um, and, and he's there to remind us that in order to make all of this possible, we actually had to invent a whole new discipline of electrical engineering, which is now, by the way, on many universities, the largest discipline on campus. The most students and the most faculty are in the electrical engineering department, right? So that when we build these worlds, we didn't just build a bunch of infrastructure. We built a bunch of people, right? We built people who know how to use electricity system. I spent an entire year training my son when he was two years old to live safely with electricity system, not to plug his finger or his tongue or whatever else he wanted to plug into that electricity plug, right? Um, we train students in electrical engineering, our workforces, right? We have literally millions of Americans who work every day in our energy systems to make those energy systems uh, work. Right, so that we are shaping when we build uh, these kinds of energy systems, not just our technological infrastructure, but our lives as people, right? Very few people know that, I, I love the little picture of the television, the, the guys watching the television in the upstairs room. It's actually the, the kids who are watching television in the upstairs room. Um, very few people in this country know that the electricity industry invented television. They invented television because they could sell electricity to the people who were making television shows. To the, they, they could sell electricity to the guys running the cameras, the video cameras. They could sell electricity to the guys powering the an antennas that transmitted broadcast television over the airwaves. They could sell electricity to you as a homeowner to run your television. And they could sell everybody in that whole supply chain, the equipment, the electrical equipment that they needed in order to run this whole system, right? So this whole idea that we 
live in a world full of electricity. We invented this world and we are people. We are electric people. We live in electric cities, right? We live in a world of electricity. And by the way, it's gonna get, it's gonna get bigger as we go forward because the biggest solution to climate change and carbon dioxide is to electrify everything. That's the new mantra in the energy sector. Electrify everything, electrify your car, electrify your heater, electrify, you know, I mean, because we can dump wind power and we can dump solar power into the electricity grid, right? So the idea here of busy town is that it tells us, it teaches us that we live in what I call socio-technological um, systems. Right? It says technologies are not simply technologies. Right? They're life worlds that we inhabit and that define us as techno-humans. Right? And the Borg is, of course, a deep exaggeration of this idea, but it's one that illustrates some very interesting features of the way that in fact we are all plugged into a host of large technological systems so that we are its workers, we are its consumers, um, and it networks us uh, in interesting and important ways that are in, that are in some ways um, integral to our notions of who we are in modern societies, our modern identities, right? Um, they shape how we think about democracy, how we think about commerce, how we think about culture. If you think about uh, our energy systems more broadly, um, there is this language, people talk about petrocultures, uh, petrostates, petrodemocracies, carbon democracies, this famous new book by Timothy Mitchell uh, in which he argues that the transition from a coal to an oil society was essential for the rise of modern democratic societies in the early 20th century. Uh, that our democracies today are fundamentally different than they were in the 19th and 18th centuries. And that a big part of the reason for that has to do with the birth uh, and growth of the oil industry and the automobile societies that we built uh, alongside of it, right? So I call these things socio-technological uh, systems, right? So we're talking about energy, we're talking about uh, water, we're talking about food and agriculture, we're talking about communications, media, and the internet, we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about urban uh, environments, Minneapolis, Phoenix, right? These are, these are technological systems in which we are integral parts. They have been shaped by our desires as human beings. And in turn, they shape us physically, cognitively, our identities and our forms of sociality and our forms of politics, right? And so I believe, and I, this is my radical statement for the first part of the talk, that socio-technical systems order human affairs far more deeply in the 21st century than nations, markets, race, or gender. I'm not gonna try to defend this claim. I'm just gonna put it out there as a postulate for you to think about, right? That who we are as people, how we live our lives are far more shaped on a day-to-day -day basis today by the socio-technical systems that we inhabit, the kinds of houses that we've built in suburbia the kinds of electricity systems that power them, the kinds of automobiles that we drive around the city and spend hours in commuting, right? These are the things that define us as human beings in critical ways in the 21st century, right? So when I think about this, all of these things are wrapped up uh, in our technological systems, the distribution of wealth and power, right? Oil has been a massive distributor of wealth and power in the 20th century. Poverty and inequality, the organization of time and work, the organization of capital, the balance between labor and capital in the economy, the forms and institutions of public and private finance, our 24 seven, 365 culture, our ideas of race and gender, our consumption patterns, our notions of geopolitics and international security, 
our democracy, our creation and movement of materials. Why do I list all of these? Because these are the things that sociologists and political scientists and economists tell us that are the central features of human societies that define who we are. And I'm saying all of these are wrapped up in our technological systems in critically significant and important ways, shaped by our politics and shaping of our politics and our eco economics, right? And the crucial point is, of course, that all of these technological systems in this sense are deeply unjust. These technological life worlds that we have uh, created for ourselves, right? And so here's just a simple, uh, example, this staircase, which is in, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, was designed to be navigable by people in wheelchairs. It is now being, it is now the subject of a lawsuit by the disability community in Vancouver to get rid of it because it fails miserably to accomplish the goals that it was set out to achieve. The ramps, it turns out, are too steep for wheelchairs to navigate successfully. And people with visual disabilities have a very difficult time with the color contrasts on this, these staircases uh, and have tripped and fallen on numerous occasions, right? So this is an illustration of how the very design of the bits and pieces of our technological infrastructure discriminate uh, against certain uh, uh, in this case, groups uh, of people, but this kind of thing is ubiquitous, right? We passed in the United States, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was a major piece, major successful piece of legislation in the late 1980s that was entirely designed to address this problem, that our technological infrastructures were excluding people with disabilities from everyday life and everyday work in America. Here's another example. This is uh, some research by a colleague, anthropologist colleague of mine, Claire Gordon, um, uh, in, who used to work for the U.S. Army. She studied the shapes and sizes of human bodies and the distribution of those shapes and sizes in the Army and how it mattered. And here is one of the results from, from her studies. She found in a study of female helicopter pilots 90% of female helicopter pilots could reach the controls. That's an interesting statement in and of itself because it says that 10% of female helicopter pilots were making adjustments in some way, shape, or form to allow themselves to fly these helicopters, even though bodily size-wise, the cockpit had been designed to exclude them from that job. But if you go out one, uh, one rung, and you ask how many female soldiers in the army can reach the controls in this cockpit, it's only 70%, right? So already you're excluding 30% of women in the army from being able to serve as a helicopter pilot, right? And if you go out another step and you think about female Hispanic soldiers, you get down to 25% can reach the controls, which means from a racial standpoint, the very design of the cockpit is discriminating against these women from becoming helicopter pilots in the U.S. Army. Here's another one. The U.S. Army buys equipment for its soldiers based on the 90th percentile of body size ranges, right? So it goes from the fifth percentile to the 95th percentile. So it doesn't actually buy equipment if you fall for you if you fall outside of those ranges. Here's the problem, 50% of ethnic Pacific Islander men serving in the US Armed Forces have body sizes that fall outside of that range. Well, so what does that mean? It meant in this particular case that those men were injured and killed at much higher rates in Iraq than their counterparts from other ethnicities because of the way that we designed and purchased technology that was designed to protect them, right? So here's to come back to the energy space, right? And think about the energy system. Here's our functional equivalent of those kinds of discrimination within the energy system. 
right? We describe in our work what we call the energy poverty nexus, complex feedback loops between energy insecurity on the one hand and economic, political, and human insecurity on the other hand. In other words, these things are feeding back and forth on each other. Because people cannot access reliable, accessible, affordable energy, in turn, that creates difficulties for them in pursuing economic opportunity. Because they have low incomes, right, that feeds into not being able to afford energy efficiency upgrades that allow them to reduce their overall energy burdens and therefore have that income available to invest in other more productive uh, ways, right? So when we think about this energy poverty nexus has multiple different dimensions, sacrifice zones, right? Places where energy supply chains have created high pollution environments where in some cases it's no longer possible to live, but in other, play, other cases, the people who live nearby to those facilities suffer from un, uh, disproportionately high uh, uh, environmental and health risks, for example. High cost burdens. Uh, I think I have the, the, uh, the, the figures later on in, in the presentation, uh, but in some cities in America, the wealthiest people in, in a particular city are paying less than 5% of their income for energy and the poorest 20% of the community is paying over 25% of their income. And that's, on, that's only if you count the simple financial cost as the burden. There, there are a number of other burdens uh, that come into play. Infrastructural decay that disproportionately impacts low income areas, uh, extractive relationships. I'll tell you a story about that uh, in a little bit. Low value energy uses, debt cycles, counterproductive policies, colonizing power relationships, environmental injustices. All of these things are at work in the energy system in different places and in different communities and in different ways that make it uh, that, that either perpetuate or exacerbate uh, poverty and inequality uh, in our uh, societies. So that's the bad news, right? That's the kind of fleshing out of the statement uh, that says that our energy systems are an important source of inequality and injustice in our society. Um, uh, so, so now for the... the, the the optimism side uh, of my talk, uh, if you will. I, I believe we are at a unique moment of opportunity for redesign. Uh, and I think that taking advantage of this opportunity, right? We're at a moment where every, uh, everyone acknowledges at some level that we must redesign the energy system. Uh, that power uh, the U.S. economy and that power the global economy, power all of our homes, right? Uh, we must uh, do that redesign uh, for purposes of human and planetary uh, sustainability. But to take advantage of this opportunity uh, to not only get clean energy, but to get clean energy that also contributes to ending the energy poverty nexus, for example, to put it that way, requires, I think, understanding where to focus our attention and our activism. Uh, and, and so, you know, I wanna highlight technology does not drive human history, right? These systems that we have built <coughs> were built by human beings for human purposes. We drive human history and we can and will and should rebuild the energy system uh, in different ways, right? Uh, the design of our socio-technological systems is flexible. I cannot emphasize this point enough. There is not one clean energy future 
There are many, many, many different variants of clean energy futures. And we need to be very explicit about which kinds of clean energy future we choose to build. Um, I've, I've said that already. Um, uh, I've said that already, right? We're already one third of the way through, uh, through um, uh, an energy revolution. And people look at me like I'm crazy, right? When I say this, um, they say, are you kidding me? Renewable energy is responsible for what? Less than 1% or roughly 1% of the world's um, uh, energy at the moment. How can you possibly say we're one third of the way through an energy revolution? Well, I think about an energy revolution differently. I think about it as having uh, three parts. The, the first part is we have to decide we're gonna do an energy revolution. Uh, the second part is we have to design how we're gonna do an energy revolution. And then the third part is we actually have to do the energy revolution. Um, and, and actually it's not easy to decide you're gonna do an energy revolution. <laughs> Uh, when everything that you do, all aspects of life and the economy uh, around the world uh, depend on the energy systems that we have built. Uh, and, and so I think, it, I think it is worth highlighting that we have, we have made it through the first stage. We have decided to do uh, an energy revolution. Uh, and, and that, in some sense, I actually think is the hardest part uh, of about this process, but we've seen, especially in the last 12 months, a huge transformation, uh, not only in the willingness of people behind closed doors to acknowledge that we must change the energy system, but in fact, to uh, declare that we will change the energy system. Legislatures have said we must achieve carbon neutrality. Companies have said we will achieve carbon neutrality. Cities have said we will achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, and I think that that is a big deal, but I also wanna emphasize that this next step is absolutely crucial. We have to design the future uh, of our energy systems uh, in productive ways. So what does that mean? Well, one thing it means is we're gonna need a lot of solar energy. So the latest projections that I've seen, and this runs across uh, dozens of different accounts, suggests that uh, by the time we get to 2050, if we want a carbon neutral future, we have to get at least half the world's energy from solar panels. Uh, there just aren't any other sources of energy that are cheap enough, widely distributed enough, um, and that we know how to generate the energy uh, uh, as solar energy. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, that means 100 billion solar panels. This is a lot of solar panels um, uh, that we need to put down on the planet uh, in order to power everything. Uh, each of those panels will generate $1,000 worth of net revenue over the course of its lifetime, on average, uh, roughly speaking. This is an estimate for the newest solar panels that First Solar is making at the moment that run about 30 cents a watt to manufacture uh, and uh, they're about 440 watt solar panels. And if you give them a 25 year light, lifetime, which may be an underestimate, um, uh, you'll, they'll generate about $1,000 worth of net revenue once you take the manufacturing cost out uh, over the course of their lifetime. So that's $100 trillion in wealth. I always love it that the International Energy Agency's estimate of what it's gonna cost us to get uh, uh, a clean energy economy and my estimate of what it's going to cost to buy uh, or to what we're going to be able to generate in terms of wealth um, <clears throat> are in the same ballpark because it means our numbers are, uh, you know, on, on par with each other. Uh, but more importantly, right, think about what that means uh, in terms of, you know, the future of political economy. Right? For the entire 20th century, international political economy was defined by who had oil and who didn't have oil. Uh, and in the future, global political economy is going to be defined by who gets the $1,000 from each of those solar panels. 
uh, how we distribute that wealth uh, around the world. And by the way, same argument can be made for batteries in electric vehicles, uh, can be made for some of these other uh, technologies that are gonna be crucial to powering uh, the future of the global economy um, as we go forward, right? And so I say the central question of political economic redesign uh, over the next three decades is who will own these panels? Right? How will we distribute ownership of those $100 billion solar panels? It's gonna have a huge impact on how wealth is distributed and how power is distributed in the 21st century. Um, and, and so I, I think we, this is one of those places where you should put your activism to work, is on figuring out how that ownership should be distributed um, and, and acting to try to uh, uh, get, get to where you want, get the world to where you want it to be. Um, and, I mean, more fully, of course, ownership is not the only thing that matters. Um, how will we weave those panels into new fabrics of social, political, uh, and economic life? So here's my uh, kind of example of how to think through this. You have three pictures. The pictures are identical. Same solar panels, same rooftops, same neighborhood of Phoenix. In one, in the left-hand column, the owner of those solar panels are the people who own those houses, right? Uh, suppose they own those solar panels and they're selling, they're marketing their power that they're producing in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electricity markets or you know, even just selling it back to the utility, right? What you have is a libertarian market model in which each individual in society is their own little economic agent. Uh, you have an individualist political economy. The wealth of individuals is ultimately what matters. Uh, and you have a highly decentralized, uh, let's call it PV economy, right? Photovoltaic, solar energy economy. In the middle one, Elon Musk owns all of those panels, every panel on every rooftop in America. Right? Elon Musk is, owns a company now called Tesla. He used to own a company called Solar City that he's folded into to Tesla. Solar City used to rent people's rooftops in order to put solar energy on, on the, in those spaces. They called it a solar lease. And they pretended that they were leasing you the solar panels. And they gave you a tiny little bit of the benefit. Um, but what they were really doing was renting your rooftop in order to generate cash for themselves by selling electricity. It was a very neoliberal market model, a monopolist political economy, right? In this model, Elon Musk owns the biggest utility in America. If he owned solar on every rooftop in America, he would own far, a far bigger electric utility than any other utility in America, right? And a highly centralized system them, even though all the solar panels are kind of spread out, right? You would still have a highly centralized political economy uh, and, and, and uh, system. And of course, in the third model, the communities own those panels, right? You have a, uh, what, I, what I would call a public power model in which there's collective ownership of this virtual power plant. Uh, if you will. You have a communitarian economy in which the benefits of energy generation are being shared among all of the members uh, of, of, of this neighborhood. Even if some of them are renting the houses, they still get, they can still be part of the benefits, right? It's the big difference between community solar and individual ownership of, of household rooftop solar is that in community solar, you can bring in the people who don't own their own home and have them participate just as equally in the model. Um, and you have a very differentiated uh, or variable kind of system. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's centralized at the neighborhood level, but decentralized uh, above that. It's kind of a mixed model, right? But the point is, I can put the same solar panels down on the same locations, 
plug them into the grid technically in exactly the same way. And I can build three very different Americas out of that model. And so this is my argument that these sol this solar future is very flexible and that we need to think hard about what the design of that future is that we want to achieve. Because of course, there's lots of other questions besides you know, the ownership question about where we put all of those panels and how we integrate them into our social and political landscapes. Uh, so in Arizona, just as an illustration, um, we are an experiment in the redesign of petrocultures into photon cultures. And we have seven different models functioning in Arizona at the moment about how you own a uh, solar panel. Uh, and, and each of them is a very different little experiment. And so we're testing out all of these uh, different models to see, I mean, we're not doing it deliberately, but just because we're, you know, kind of a place that doesn't buy much into government regulation, there's actually been a fair bit of space for people to try out uh, different kinds of uh, political economic models of the future of solar energy here. And it makes for an interesting uh, little experimental uh, space, uh, if you will. It's also because we're on the cutting edge because there's a lot of crazy sunlight here uh, when you push it. So, you know, to reiterate, right, I want to say um, uh, that, that the, the real question of the future is not solar versus coal. That one's done. It's solar versus solar. Right? What model are we going to build for the future of renewable uh, energy? This humble solar cell is an unbelievably flexible technology. We are currently using photovoltaic technologies to generate energy at scales from microwatts to gigawatts. I mean, it's really quite remarkable that the different range of opportunities that we have as a human society to deploy photovoltaic technologies into a wide range uh, of different kinds of social, economic, and political arrangements. And it's really the design of that that I think is crucial. And for me, the, then the next question is, how do we use this solar panel, this humble solar panel, this flexible instrument, if you will, uh, to reverse the energy poverty nexus? And so I have three, um, you know, basic principles that I want to offer up as suggestions here to end the talk uh, about how to do that. I'm sure you all will have many, many more because I'm sure you're much more going to be much more creative about this than I am. Um, but my first is BYOB, uh, not bring your own booze uh, or beer or whatever you want that B to stand for, but rather build it in your own backyard. Uh, and, and the reason for this has to do with that very first um, line on the list of all the bad things that energy systems do, where I said sacrifice zones. Energy systems create sacrifice zones all over the place, right? And what's the best way to get people, to get the energy system not to create sacrifice zones, and that's to make them build it in their own backyard. Right? There's nothing that enables more effectively uh, a system to create sacrifice zones than when the people who are in control of the decision making don't live anywhere near where the, the stuff is being done to either the planet or the people or whatever uh, in the sacrifice zone. Right? And, and solar energy is not exempt from this phenomenon. Um, a colleague of mine was just the other day telling us a story about India. They had built a large scale solar power plant on a bunch of land that used to be owned by small farmers. Um, they had tried, but largely unsuccessfully, uh, to um, uh, make the building of that solar plant, plant benefit the farmers by paying for their land and, and even by creating a part of the revenue stream that came from the solar power plant and giving that to them. But the, the reality was this was a rural area. They had nothing else to do. They had no other way to generate economic activity for themselves and for their community than this farmland. And this farmland was now gone. 
And so, yeah, you could dribble a small revenue stream into them from the power plant, but it didn't create productive, meaningful work for them that could sustain the economic life, livelihood uh, of that community, right? They had been transformed into a sacrifice uh, zone, right? By contrast, the bottom um, graph here is some very recent data. I'm not sure you've even seen this yet, Cecilio, from NREL for Puerto Rico. Uh, the yeah, National no. Renewable Energy Lab just finished this calculation for us. This is if you put rooftop solar on all of the low income build residential housing in Puerto Rico on a, on a municipality by municipality basis, how much of the electricity consumption could that offset? And the answer is 300% all across the island. There's far more capacity to build rooftop solar energy uh, in low income communities in, in Puerto Rico than is actually needed to serve those folks, which means you've got 200% left over that could be used to generate revenue streams, that could be used to, for productive economic uses within those uh, communities to drive economic development, uh, and, and all of that from rooftop solar. There's this vision in the, in the electricity industry that we must build large power plants, that we cannot satisfy our energy demands uh, from rooftop, but here's evidence that at least for 3 million people, uh, it is possible to, uh, with rooftop solar energy, in fact, the, the total amount of residential rooftop solar energy in Puerto Rico, not just LMI, but all residential rooftops in Puerto Rico, um, is sufficient to satisfy the entire electricity demand of the island, all the industry, all the manufacturing, everybody, everything, right? Just with rooftop uh, solar uh, energy on residential buildings, right? So there's lots of opportunity here to do things differently than building these giant solar plant power plants out, uh, in, the, uh, out in farmland or in, uh, in, in other uh, environments that we wanna protect uh, et cetera. All right, so here's my second principle, distribute ownership uh, as broadly as possible. On the left is the uh, energy burden uh, calculations for 25 biggest cities in the United States. The, the red dots are the percent of the highest earning quintile, right? So the richest quintile of uh, of Americans in each of those cities, that's the percent of their income that they spend on energy. It ranges from 2% to 8% of their income. The blue on the right is the lowest um, income quintile, right? The highest energy burden ranges from 7% to 26% across American cities. Um, I should show the graph with this for Puerto Rico. It's much higher in Puerto Rico. Uh, the energy burden uh, is, is as high as 50% in some, some communities in Puerto Rico, right? And so on the right, you see the economic inequality charts, which you've all seen, that show that economic inequality is rising. And, and just as we think about ownership of, for example, homes, as a pathway uh, to economic security uh, for many households. Likewise, I think that ownership of energy assets can become part of a pathway uh, to economic security for communities, uh, for households, for low-income businesses, uh, and for others as well. And so my third principle um, is, is to change our thinking about energy. We're used to saying, look, people will use energy however they want to use energy. Um, so what we really need to focus on is how do we get them the energy they need? Uh, and, and in some really interesting work that we're doing in partnership with Cecilio uh, and others in Puerto Rico and also in Sierra Leone and in Nepal and elsewhere, we're flipping that around and we're saying, well, if people actually had more energy, what would they do to it, do with it, 
that would create real value in their lives? Uh, and this, it turns out, is an important question and one which uh, is too infrequently asked. And so as part of these, these projects, we found, for example, that uh, clean energy can actually be an enabler of all of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. We can use clean energy to improve food security. We can use clean energy to create better jobs. Uh, we can use clean energy to uh, create clean water, right? Uh, and so if you think about energy projects as integrated into sustainable development projects, you get better outcomes than if you just do them separate. And then in relationship to this, we've introduced this idea of the difference between generative uses of energy and extractive uses of energy. And it has to do with whether the net balance uh, of the project uh, is creating more value for the community uh, than it is leaving the community to pay for the energy versus projects where the amount of, of value that's leaving the community to pay for the energy exceeds the amount of value that the community is getting. And I will tell you this big graph in the middle is one of, to me, the most disturbing um, trends in clean energy access uh, work that's going on uh, worldwide. And it has to do with the, the extent to which the television has come to define the second most important use of electricity uh, for communities. Um, uh, if I, and, and the reason turns out to be, you know, perfectly neoliberal, if you will, right? It turns out if you give somebody a television and then give them the electricity to power it, they will always pay their electricity bill, no matter how big it gets no matter how much it drains them of disposable income because they don't want their television to be cut off, right? It's a really extractive uh, form of activity and a number of the companies that are building off-grid electricity systems in Africa are now using televisions as lost leaders in these communities, essentially, right? So you're essentially turning an entertainment technology into a way of guaranteeing your income stream as a, as a company. Uh, and in most cases, uh, our suspicion is at any rate that this is extractive. That is to say, it's not creating value, real value for the community. Um, by contrast, you see a picture here from a project that my colleague Metric Chetri has been doing with, an, with ASU students in Nepal, where they built a solar system uh, that is powering a water system for uh, a community that's an agricultural community. Uh, that community is now able to grow substantially more uh, food in their, um, uh, on their lands. They're uh, able now not only to support themselves uh, and be, be food self-sufficient, but they're able to have significantly uh, greater amounts of food that they can then sell uh, in the cities as a source of income and, and economic uh, well-being uh, for the community. Um, and so that's an example of, of what we call a generative use of uh, energy. So again, coming back to this idea, what you, how you integrate these solar panels, these new energy systems into people's lives, into their, uh, their, their economies, uh, into their communities, uh, matters enormously how we do that integration and what we enable and empower them to do uh, with our energy systems. So the question fundamentally that we're asking is what does 100 billion solar panels look like as a social justice project, right? Not as a, um, how do we, uh, not just as a how do we power the global economy question. Uh, but as how do we empower the global economy of the future and the global cities of the future uh, uh, and the global societies of the future in a way that creates social justice? We see that as a design question, as I've tried to articulate. 
How do we design the human relationship to energy differently in the future? Um, all of these things are opportunities for designing one way as opposed to another way. They're opportunities for activism uh, to help ensure that the redesign of our future technological worlds contributes positively to the human future uh, as opposed to negatively in that sense. What kind, in other words, of photon societies will we build with solar energy? So thank you very much. Uh, I have, uh, I'm delighted to have had the opportunity uh, to talk with you this morning and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Clark. Um, um, Rudy, um, usually my, my uh, litmus test for a presentation, is, it, it leaves me with at least 10 or 20 more questions than what I started. <laughs> and uh, this one certainly, uh, <coughs> that, that category. Um, as I look around the faces, we, I, I see that there's uh, more colleagues, friends, and uh, brothers and sisters that have joined uh, in today's uh, conversation with Clark uh, here in our energy justice class. Um, if I open the floor, um, if, please. If, uh, if any of you wants to uh, start us with a with a question, I have. Uh, I have plenty of my own, but I um, would like uh, some of the students, perhaps, uh, or some of our visitors here in Minnesota through uh, uh, through Zoom. I see some from Puerto Rico, some from Arizona, uh, some from Boston, some from uh, uh, other places. So feel free. Students first. So that's first, yes. Of course, not all at the same time. I can ask something, I have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen um, Planet of the Humans, but in, in that movie, there's this idea brought up that like, what are solar panels like made of and are we making like a renewable energy source from non-renewable. I, I don't know if I'm using the right words to like no. frame this question, but if we're making, trying to make like a sustainable infrastructure out of like a fundamentally unsustainable system no. that can't be made sustainable and what your thoughts are on that. Because like if, if the material of solar panels are themselves not a sustainable building source, then we're trying to make um, like, a way of energy out of like an unsustainable way of energy. It's kind of paradoxical that way. So I'm curious what you think about that. Um, you know, I think that the question of how to build a, a circular economy out of solar panels, um, of how to ensure that the supply chains that feed the solar panel industry are not riven with sacrifice zones of their own. Um, I think these are absolutely critical questions uh, for the future. Um, they are questions that we should ask of any, uh, of ener any, any, and any and every technology that we deploy, especially when we deploy them at planetary scales. Uh, we need to be asking these these very kinds of questions. Um, I, I one one that haunts me uh, is the is the construction and disposal. Right. If you think about, we need a hundred billion solar panels, and I said we had a twenty five year lifetime. Right. Hopefully, we get to a fifty year lifetime. But suppose we get to a 50, 50 year lifetime. We still got to put up and take down 2 billion solar panels a year, steady state, right? That is a massive disposal problem, right? It's a massive deconstruction and reconstruction uh, enterprise. Now, 
you know, we're doing the same thing in oil and coal right now all the time, right? The amount of investment in new wells and new fields is enormous because we have to, right? To supply our uh, energy uh, avarice, if you will. And so there's absolutely, it is absolutely also clear uh, that I think that um, we need to pair um, uh, the future of energy that we decide to build with uh, a, a commitment to where possible doing things with as little energy as we can, right? So that we minimize the size of that overall footprint uh, as best as possible. Um, you know, these are, these are the very real challenges that we confront and, and nobody should assume that solar energy just magically is some amazing technology. Now, all, having said all of that, right, if you take any metric of the kind of material and environmental and social footprint of an energy industry built around oil versus an energy industry built around coal versus an energy industry built around solar panels versus an energy industry built around wind. I mean, there, there are a small number of metrics on which wind and solar compete uh, for badness on that footprint. Um, but for the vast majority of those metrics, it's just not even close, right? So, but having, you know, I mean, I, I, we should not therefore exact, just because on so many metrics, it is better to do it with photovoltaics, doesn't mean we should exempt them from being absolutely critical uh, about making sure that uh, we don't uh, do problematic things in building the solar energy of the future, solar industry of the future. Ramon, I guess I saw your hand. You're muted. No, I I mean I have a, a prior to four. Uh, well, some time I have to go. So. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Another question. Yes, um, Sally. Can you, sorry. Oh, and El Elvia, I think, I think has her hands up. Uh, you Hi, know, Elvia. Just, hola. <laughs> just hola. Throwing, <laughs> let me put my, my video. Just throwing it out there. Um, so, so in the end, it is people, you know, people's decisions driving the systems. And, and the, to me, the evolution of, of energy systems has been <coughs> has been highly political with, with a lot of inequality like like you explain so how how do we get out of the cycle um, eh, I mean Vote. it's it's uh, <laughs> I, I mean it is clear to me that yeah. whoever controls the energy has the power and they're not going to let go of that power. Uh, so I can see individuals, I've seen, I've seen individuals getting out of the cycle, but uh, I think it's a little bit more difficult to, to achieve that independence at the, at the community level. It, it's slower. I, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's 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 gonna be slower. And for some uh, from for some countries or jurisdictions, particularly those in debt, it's gonna be. A, I mean, it's gonna take a miracle <laughs> to to get out of that cycle. So. I certainly take your point. 
Um, I, I think we've been given a great, we've been given two great boons with regard to that. Whether we can take advantage of those or not uh, is another question. Um, if you look at the 20 largest corporations in the world by uh, market capitalization, now it's changed over the year. In the last couple of years, the craziness in the tech sector, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon has gone, gone wild. Um, but historically, if you looked at the 20 largest companies in the world, more than half of them have always been energy companies. Okay, now that's not because energy is more than half of the world's economy, it's not. It's because energy has always been a highly concentrated industry in terms of ownership. Um, and particularly petrochemicals and automobiles. So some, some subset of those companies have always been oil companies and another subset of them have always been automobile companies. Um, and one of the, the interesting factoids is that the electricity industry has never been that concentrated. It runs these little micro, micro monopolies of a few million people at a time, but that's radically different than ExxonMobil and a few billion people at a time in terms of the kind of distribution of political economy, right? So one of the great boons that we have is that our electric utilities are closer to us in scale and size at the community level um, uh, than our oil companies have ever been. Now that doesn't automatically make them good guys uh, and it doesn't automatically make it easier uh, to change them, but it does say that the project of, of relating to them as a community is, is not necessarily as hard as it might be to relate to uh, some of the big oil companies. And in the future, everything is going to run through the electric company. So I do think this is one of those crunch points, right? It is one of those points where we should put our activism. If we electrify transportation, we double the size of the electric utility, right? If we, if we take all of our cars and we make them electric vehicles, all that does is increase the amount of electricity we have to produce and consume, right? So we, we make the electric companies more important. Now it turns out we have 3000 electric utilities in the United States and most of those are public utilities. Now our colleagues from Puerto Rico will remind us public utilities aren't necessarily good actors. <laughs> but it's a more variegated environment. And it is a smaller environment, an environment of smaller players. Um, players for whom, I mean, I, will, I would tell you this, if I was the United States federal government and you said, go up against Exxon Mobil, I would, it would make me worry if you said, if I was the federal government and you said to me, go up against APS, Arizona Public Supply, no problem. I'm not even gonna worry, right? So if you just think about the distribution of power in our society, our electric utilities are less powerful than our oil companies are. So that's the big, the first big boon that I think that we've been given. The second big boon is that solar panel can be bought and purchased at much different scales, then you don't have to be a billion dollar company to own solar energy. Uh, it makes financial sense for every individual, every household, every community in Arizona to go solar on a local basis. It might be a little bit better for them in terms of the pure cost of electricity if their utility went solar for them and just sold them the electricity. They might get slightly cheaper power from that. But it, it still makes sense. If you, if you look at electricity prices in Arizona, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, 
on average. Right now, if you put rooftop solar on your roof, even without any subsidies, you can do it for eight or nine cents a kilowatt hour, which means it makes financial sense for distributed solar to take off. And it has as a result, right? And so you don't have to have the concentration of ownership to make a solar economy work that you have to have to make an oil economy work. Uh, that's the second great boon we've been given. Now, can we leverage those boons into a better future? We will see, but that's where I would put my activism, distributed ownership and negotiating with my electric utility, working the legislature on my electric utility. However you need to do it on your electric utility to get them to buy into uh, a different vision of what the future uh, might look like. It'll be really hard for some of them because of the way their revenues are calculated, their profits are calculated, particularly for the investor owned ones, like the Excels and the APSs and, and so forth. It'll be harder, but you could change those rules. Those rules are not set by the market. They're set by your public utility commission. So go to your public utility commission and get them to change those rules. Right? These are the kinds of activism that I think local movements can, uh, can push for. So I, I totally understand your, the challenge that, that you're posing in front of us, LVN. I agree it's a serious one. Uh, and so let, let's focus our energy and our time and our activism uh, on, on making the changes stick that will enable us to do different things and design different kinds of political economies of energy in the future. I don't know if uh, Elvia uh, um, has another, a constant question or uh, <laughs> if not, I'm going uh, It's to, just, it's a, it's a. <coughs> I'm going to lower. Uh, may, may, maybe this is a, uh, the, the, the case of Puerto Rico. Uh, there's been a lot of plenty of activism going around, especially after Maria. Yeah. I mean, the, it's not the lack of vision or the lack of desire. If you, if you threw a poll right now, I think most people will want to go solar. But the electrical, Puerto Rico is in debt. The electrical company owes a debt. And... Between yeah. the within the Congress and the local government, the 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 regulations, you know, the 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 state of the law, is to make sure that energy remains centralized. Yeah. That it transitions to gas of all things, and this is Congress, right? I know. This yeah. is Congress, so I. I I think for I think for us, as I said, it's gonna take. I seeing individuals going off the grid. I mean, that's that's happening. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's better because it's like everybody it's on their own, you know. And right. yep. But it's uh, imagine that the that we don't even have the power as, as constituents <coughs> to make decisions on, on where our taxes go and let alone on, on the energy decisions because there is a federal law that, that focuses, has a whole chapter on energy and you can see it. It's gonna favor projects that, that use gas and renewables, and they don't put any percentages for a reason. Uh, yeah. 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 So. No, I'm with you. Um, I, I, in, there are gonna, yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna continue to be a fight um, uh, to design the future uh, in ways that um, that truly benefit people, um, I'm not. I, my optimism is not uh, that it's going to be easy. My optimism is that the possibility exists 
uh, and if we can put it in front of people, uh, we can do the work. And you know, this energy transition is going to be an enormously uh, long, hard slog. No matter how we do it, uh, but. I think we, the, my optimism comes from the possibilities that are in front of us uh, and from what I believe is the commitment, particularly of our youth, uh, to make uh, better futures and to learn what they need to learn about the details of how these things work, that they can get in there and make these changes happen. I, I want to take a, a, a stab uh, uh, quickly to say a couple of things um, as we reach the end of our of our session. Uh, I think it's absolutely uh, it has been very illustrative in today's presentation uh, from the issue of justice and now. I'm talking not only to my students, but particularly to my students, but to everybody else. The importance, first of all, of when you talk about justice, discern from distributive justice <coughs> and procedural justice uh, as you as you approach energy as a, as an issue. Mm -hmm. And Clark himself has has been in his, you know in his brightness has the ability to, in his last answer to Elvia, open the door to, a, to the furthering of that, of that questioning. If you, if, you, if you look at what he just described is possibly something that gets closer to Ostrom's polycentric uh, model, uh, where you have multiple utilities, uh, and and uh, and they they might look like a, a politically at a, a at a disadvantage at some point and advantage at, at at that point. If I ask you to look closer to home and each one of those utilities and the power those utilities uh, are able or capable to impose in local regimes, local. <coughs> decision-making regimes, the picture of the power of those utilities all of a sudden exposes the kinds of injustices, the kind of power imbalances that at the local level can occur if, if things are led to their own devices in terms of a political economy or a microeconomics of of local energy consumption and generation power uh, uh, distribution and transmission. So it brings me an example back in uh, when, when I was at UTEP in the Southwest and I was looking at, at that political economy. And we used to study Cesar Chavez and the way he, he craftily was able to mobilize uh, laborers in the um, the great industry to challenge the unjust and inhuman practices of a polycentric model of wine growers in that area. And in doing so, one of the things that he wanted to do as a, as a, a, a tactic was to get the politics out of the farm, the, the, the owners of the farms wanted to fight their fight in the farm, keep it local because I have domination of the local discourse, the dialogue, I, 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 I go to church with you, I go by the same supermarket with you and, 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 and Chavez says, I'm never gonna win this fight locally. And I, and I think Elvia knows where I'm going with this and Clark is already laughing because it's, it's, uh, it's like one, one of the things we've been trying to do with Rice is look, we're not gonna fight, we're not gonna win this fight, just us inside. We need to build a network of supporters 
of other minds that are thinking like us in terms of justice and equality in the energy field. And, and we need to get together to build a different front and tell this story in different places. Well, today we're telling the story in McAllister and our students are, 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 are getting the benefits of that discussion thanks to Clark. But imagine a world where we could go to Congress, not just as Puerto Ricans, but as a front that wants to make sure that Puerto Rico does not go down the tubes just because of a few Puerto Ricans. And that group, imagine, that includes people like Clark, includes people like Ropali here, includes people like, and, and that, that mesh network of resources mobilizes in a way that it doesn't let anybody behind. Whether you're behind because of the fires in California or whether you're behind out of the, a polar vortex in Minneapolis or you're behind uh, because of uh, price variations and socioeconomic variables in Phoenix, it, it, it doesn't let anybody behind. And I, I think the door that Clark has opened with his presentation today is it allows us to imagine, it allows us to imagine how at the regime local level, how we can get innovative and make sure that innovation works for justice at the local level, at, at those regimes that are so recalcitrant so resilient <laughs> that won't go down. And I, I want to recognize that I, I, I am absolutely amazed <coughs> that among us, we had engineer Josue Ortiz, uh, and that among us, uh, we, we had colleagues that belong, have been members of the, of the board of directors of PREPA listening to this presentation. And, and uh, um, uh, as part of this dialogue, look at Talia smiling because she, she, she knows where I'm going with this. So the, <laughs> the, uh, that this is, a, you know, I wish we had more time. I wish we could do this 10 times. And I wish we could realize be, that because of COVID, we have now gotten innovative and try to find ways to co-produce knowledge in ways that this technology allows us to, that sometimes our own institutions had not thought before. And right. now we have to build a new world where, where these discussions are the norm and not the, uh, the feature. Uh, and, but we, we have to start one step at a time. And I think we, we, we owe a debt of gratitude to Clark uh, for taking of his time to be here with us. And um, I, I would, I see Elvia's already clapping. I'm gonna clap myself um, and uh, just thank, say thanks. Thank you. I need to run, uh, of course. <laughs> but it was a great pleasure to be here and chat with you. And as Cecilia says, I'm more than happy to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, and uh, so I, I, and I look forward to doing that. So thank you. Take thank care, you, everybody. Clark. Thank you all for thank being with us. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. We'll do this again Wednesday. Our next, our next lecturer will be Diana Hernandez from Columbia University School of Social Medical Studies, who would be exploring with us uh, issues related to energy insecurity and, uh, and justice. Until then, and my class until tomorrow. So we'll, we'll see you guys. Take care and thank you.